Hello and welcome everybody to the inaugural Scion and Brentford Area Forum. Fantastic, so many, so many people here. Uh, in fact, uh, I was just told we're at capacity, but luckily the uh, standing room only, but the uh, ever flexible team here at the Brentford Free Church have said, no problem, Nikki's wonderful, she's opened the doors, we've got some chairs, um, and of course, Sod's Law will dictate that no one else will turn up and those chairs will be empty, but that's fine. Um, so we've got a slight change to the agenda. Uh, first up, we're going to have the police. Then we're going to have a presentation on line bikes, uh, followed by noise pollution, thriving communities, uh, and then the open forum to discuss antisocial behaviours. Uh, behavior. Um, can we start with um, uh, any apologies? Councillor Sarai. Um, uh, Councillor got a line bed for lateness. Yep. Oh, for lateness. Thank you. Sounds great. Any declarations of interest? Uh, any communications members? No. Okay. And members are asked to note the monitoring officer's guidance on members' declarations of interest. So first up, we're going to have the local policing update. So over to you guys and welcome to Sergeant Ali. Oh, there we are. Can everyone hear me now? Perfect. Uh, I'm Sergeant Ali. I've started um, a couple of wards. Uh, so I've, I cover Brentford East, Brentford West, Ostley and Side and Brentford Lock. Started here two weeks ago. So if you just bear with me. Um, in regards to the ward priorities, uh, if I start with uh, Brentford uh, Lock, uh, your police uh, sergeant knows myself, Sergeant Ali, uh, your PCs are PC Ben Wheatcroft, and you've got PCSO Aki. Uh, the ward priorities are VORG, ASB, theft of pedicycles and drugs. Um, there have been no, no significant violence issues within uh, Brentford Lock. Um, ASB drug use is ma managed by uh, patrols within the areas, uh, again, it's not been a high issue. There's been a little residential burglary. There's a problem with theft of cycles, um, but we run a number of uh, sessions, coffee with coppers, uh, to try and uh, relieve that, give crime prevention advice around that. Uh, and some events we have is Cycle Safety Day, Coffee with Copper, and we've done a uh, a border joint force working day uh, with immigration stop number of cars um, a number of tickets were given for uh, traffic offenses um, and other issues um, we also conducted stop and searches uh, to deter, uh, violence ensure any knives um, and also done weapon recovery sweeps oh, perfect. moving on to Brentford East um, Brentford East, you've got a PCSO, uh, Victoria, and PC Gill, who cover those walls at the moment. Um, the main issues, uh, all the world priorities were uh, patrolling parks, ASB, and burglary. Again, we've run, number, uh, run a number of uh, coffee with coppers, crime prevention advice, and officers are on patrols within those areas as well uh, to prevent any crime. Um, and lastly, moving on to Brentford West, we only have one PCSO, which is Angela. If anyone's around there, I'm sure you see her around on the bikes. Um, and the main, again, is burglary was a uh, thing I brought up, ASB and parks issues. Um, again, uh, we've had a number of events, crime prevention events, uh, and uh, patrols within the area to deter crime. And if I hand it back to the chair. Fantastic. Thank you for that whistle stop. Um, so obviously tonight's area forum is all about antisocial behaviour as well as an open forum for general questions. The, the antisocial behaviour will fall into some matters where it's more within the council's remit and some matters where it's more to do with the police. So if you've got a pressing, if you've got any question for the police, but if you've got, if you've got an antisocial behaviour question that you're holding back that you think is more to do with a police issue, it, um, stuff like intimidation, harassment... Uh, violence, that sort of stuff. Um, this is the moment because the police are going to leave once they've done this because they're very hard working and they've got to head down the pub. I mean, head straight back onto the beat. Um, so if you've got a question for the police, now's your moment. 
Hold on, just wait for the microphone. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much for making your presence over here. What is happening to the neighborhood policing? That I've been a member and we have not heard it for the, since the last forum. And I'm really looking forward to, you know, empowering the local people, public representatives, officials, and the police to work all together because then it can help the local area what we all trying to achieve on individual level but can work together as a team and to, to, to make the society better for everyone. So did you, was your question, what's happening with neighborhood policing? Okay, um, so I know about, give or take 10 years ago, there used to be four police officers, three PCSOs, and a sergeant per ward. Um, obviously that's not happened over a number of years, uh, but the commissioner's push now is to bring back neighborhood policing, but that won't be happening like overnight, is a gradual push back into neighborhood policing, but the mission is to try and get two police officers one PCSO and one sergeant to cover four wards. I know it won't be what it's like before, but I think this is the first step to try and get neighbor policing back to how it was. Um, but on top of that, what I'm trying to work towards, work towards our, as our MSC, which is our volunteer police officers, to come back with us as well, so to bolster numbers for that reason. Uh, but what I'm saying to the PCSOs and myself as well, that I'm trying to get out to the wards, meet people, because I think that builds loads of bridges as well and sorts of loads of issues out, so you're getting first-hand information. Yeah, right at the back. Wait for the microphone to come to you, please. And so just a, mo a mention here, if anyone is uh, hard of hearing and has a hearing aid, uh, there are seats uh, just where Sam is in the baseball cap, the ro his row in the row behind. Um, if anyone needs as a hearing aid, you can swap with someone there. But sorry, go ahead, at, right at the back. Hi. Um, there was a, um, an incident quite recently, a few weeks ago. There was a gang of children from school outside by the bus stop by uh, Osterley, uh, Tesco's Osterley. They were completely unruly. They were trying to get on the bus when the driver was trying to get off to have his break and wouldn't get off the, the bus. Then they were running in the roads and one bloke nearly ran them over and told them off. Then they were trying their best to smash they were kept kicking and kicking the perspex on the bus stop. You know, this was just one gang of kids that were from the blue school. I wrote to the, the headmaster. Uh, I did take photos of them so that the headmaster saw exactly who they were. Um, he did thank me for it. But they, this, you know, they're not the only ones. There's a lot of schools, and these are younger kids. These aren't older kids these are probably year eight something like that I'm just wondering what you're doing for children to, to let them know that that just just isn't acceptable and when they get on the bus they're sort of jostling and things like that they're, they're shouting at each other and you can see a lot of people are really nervous around them and they're terrified to say anything and this is happening daily thank you uh, sorry, yeah, I mean, I agree with you in regards to that. I know unruly kids or kids uh, causing criminal damage is, uh, is not on. Uh, but what we do is work with safer schools. Um, and I know they give talks in regards to how to behave. Um, but what I will say is if you, I'm not sure if anyone did call police, I'm sure they did. But if you see anything like that, just ring 999 on, uh, you know, like we dispatch close to the police unit to that area. Richard. Um, thank you. Um, just building on the first ASF's question to begin with, um, Sajjan Ali, can you just quantify how um, short your team is on resourcing um, the uh, interest in the, the current number of vacancies for PCs and PCSOs on your patch? Um, also, perhaps you could comment on the um, length of tenure, the number of months service that your team have got in terms of ex local experience. And then finally, what you think stakeholders, including the councillors here, um, can and should do about um, help, um, helping get the resources that we need in our neighbourhood policing teams to provide um, safer um, communities for local residents? I'll try and remember all the questions you asked me. Um, in regards to the numbers we have, um, 
I'm coming four wards. Um, I've got three PCs and three PCSOs. What I'm meant to have is uh, eight police officers and four PCSOs. Um, in regards to resourcing, um, the, the issue around policing is that everyone moves off to different jobs, etc., cetera, um, and we're trying to retain staff. Um, and also the push for, you know, neighborhood policing has only just come in, I'd say about eight months ago, give or take, but that still takes time for people to come in. Uh, and I know the commissioner and the, the borough commanders is push for trying to get neighborhood policing back up. So that's something we're working towards and it will get filled. Uh, but again, it takes time. It's not going to happen over the like, next couple of months. It will, it will take time. But uh, there has an advert come, went out recently, so we are trying to get the police officers in there. Um, in regards to service, did you say? Um, yeah, no, I, my question was about um, getting the right number of bodies there. And of course, neighborhood policing has been around forever. It's just it's only in the last eight months or, or so that it's become more of a priority. Um, and uh, so I think it was what's, my question was, what support can stakeholders, including the councillors, do about um, uh, making sure that um, you get the, the bodies on your team, the, uh, the PCs and the PCSO. So you're five PCs short, um, one PCSO short. Um, how do we make sure that when there's intake, uh, people are trained, that they are coming to neighbourhood policing in Brimford and Sion, um, um, and that rather than being allocated um, in Uxbridge or Acton or somewhere else in the in the West area. So the question is, what support can stakeholders such as councillors yeah. provide to the police? Um, to be honest, I, d I don't know if I'm being honest with you, uh, but I know there is a push for Hanslow in general for neighbourhood policing because we there is a shortage. If I'm being honest, and there is a push for it at the moment, but that's something someone higher up than me is sort of trying to push for at the moment. So I'm not sure what support you can give. Well, w w the a lot of the councillors have met with Sergeant Ali and we'll continue to develop that and explore that. Thanks for your question, Richard. Any other questions for the police? No, in that case, thank you very much for your time. Great to have you guys with us. Thank you. Thank you. So, I will look forward to working with everyone and if you ever see me out and about, always make sure you say hello. Um, I'll stick around for another 15, 20 minutes. If you have any questions, just come out and see Yeah, if me. anyone's got any uh, sort of personal matters they'd like to speak to the police with, just do so outside. If we can, because um, we've opened up the partition now, I think pr I'll privacy and disturbance, if we can keep that separate. Um, so next up, we've got a uh, presentation on Lime Bikes. Um, I don't know if anyone in this room is aware, we're now running Lime Bikes in the borough. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, if I can pass over to Councillor Dunn. Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so just um, a quick sort of run through from me about the, what, what, what's going on with Lime Bikes um, and, and about the trial and, and what's happening. Um, so to give the history to this, um, so prior to, to our um, trial uh, starting uh, uh, in June, line, box, line bikes were operating in parts of the borough, not through any agreement, just that they were operating and they are perfectly entitled to do that. It's not something that, that the council can stop them doing. Um, this was mostly in the east of the borough um, because there, there tends to be more operational in, in, in other boroughs around um, the, the border onto the, the east end of the borough. Um, so under that, that kind of regime or, or lack of regime, then the issue with line bikes is that, and how they're designed as a dockless bike scheme, is that you, you pick them up from wherever they happen to be lying around, you go on your journey, hire the bike, go on your journey, and then you leave it wherever you like again lying around. Of course, you are asked to park responsibly, but there's very little definition of what that means. Um, so what uh, several boroughs now across London are doing is moving towards is moving towards a model um, 
of the still dockless bikes, so that they don't have docks um, to, to go into, like the um, Santander bike scheme, um, but to have what is known as mandatory parking bays. So these are areas where when you end your journey um, on the line bike, you, have, you can't just leave it anywhere, you have to park it within a designated parking area. Um, and so that's the model that the council uh, decided that it would adopt and then went into discussion with Lyme. And I should say that not just Lyme, I mean, we had discussions with other e-bike um, operators as well, uh, but at this time, um, none of the other ones uh, were interested in, in um, having a scheme in Hounslow. So it's just Lyme. Um, so under the scheme, the council has identified uh, these spaces for parking bays. Um, it's done under an experimental traffic order, so it is a trial, it is a consultation that is ongoing um, whilst it, the, the trial goes ahead. Um, and so in order for such a scheme to work, you have to have a certain density of bays, you know, they have to be within short walking distances of places that people want to travel to, otherwise there's no point to the scheme, it doesn't work. Um, and so bays were chosen on that location, but also obviously looking at um, safety um, and, and other aspects uh, of, of where they might or might not be suitable. Um, and and um, consultations were carried out uh, with ward councillors around that and, and, um, and we took representations from them, from residents in, in some cases. And, and some, of the, some of those initial locations were changed, but there are ones that have rolled out, as you know. So we're rolling it out in three stages. Um, the first stage was Chiswick and Brentford, and that was the first one that happened in June. The second stage now has rolled out into um, Isleworth and Hounslow, and then the third stage for the rest of the borough will come next month. Um, so, as with any scheme like this, we're going to have we're going to encounter issues, problems, things that need to be to be dealt with, um, and I'd say the biggest problem that we have encountered, the, the biggest problem that there is for Lyme at the moment, and, and perhaps for other e-bike operators, but obviously I'm not familiar with them, they're not in our borough, so maybe not our problem, is, uh, is the so-called hacking of bikes. So this is where it's not legitimate users, it's not people who are signed up to the app with the credit card, with, you know, with the, the, the details, um, but people who want to use the bike for free, know how to bypass the, the security and the controls on that, um, are quite happy to ride the bike without the battery, which is kind of defies the point really of, of having an e-bike. Um, but yeah, are taking these bikes and then of course have no incentive to, to park them responsibly, unlike legitimate users who are incentivized to park them properly. So using the geofencing um, that, that, um, that is in place, uh, in boroughs like Hounslow that have mandatory parking uh, bays, then it won't, the, the app won't let you end your ride um, until you are in the right location. Now that's not, you know, 100% accurate. There's obviously a margin of error there. Um, so it might allow you to leave your bike sort of outside of a, a parking bay if you were near enough to it. Um, However, you then have to supply what's called a post-trip photo. So you use your, your, the app on your phone to take a photograph of the bike to prove that you have parked it within the parking bay that gets sent to Lyme. And if they then uh, determine that you have not parked it correctly, then um, I think the first step is a warning. It then moves on to a fine. Fine start at two pounds, which doesn't sound very much, but it's still more or less a warning at that stage. But then they ramp up. Uh, uh, to 20 pounds eventually and um, if you get caught again doing it after that then you get chucked off the app and, and so you can't use it anymore um, and so that's how it works for, for legitimate users um, so what we found um, we've obviously we're working closely with Lyme to look at statistics and, and figures um, from this and uh, what I can tell you from the first uh, month of the scheme is that over 
40,000 uh, trips on line bikes were started in the borough uh, on these bikes and over 39,000 trips ended in the borough. They're predominantly used for short rides, so people, the average distance travelled is two and a half kilometres um, with an average trip time of 11 and a half minutes. There are um, 11,500 active users um, in the borough and when it comes to parking compliance um, it's currently at 85% and that has increased uh, from 80% I think in the first week so we are seeing that going up and, and Lyme have set a target of 90% parking compliance. Um, this does mean that Lyme are issuing over a thousand fines currently per week. Uh, and what they do find is that 80% of those people who are fined don't then go on to uh, commit any more parking offences. Um, so, in essence, so we've seen a growth um, in the figures. Lots of people are finding it a very useful service, enjoy using it. Um, but obviously, you know, I, I, my inbox has seen a lot of people complaining about bikes that aren't parked in the right place. And what are we doing about that? So what are we doing? We're talking to Lyme. They, are, they have a fix um, for the, the hacking problem. This is a software and a hardware fix. So they have to, in terms of the software fix, that's easy. They update the app. But in terms of the hardware fix, obviously, that has to be put on bike by bike. So that is being rolled out over the summer. And this isn't just for Hounslow. Of course, this is for their whole bike fleet. Um, we are, the second thing of course then is what happens to bikes that are parked in the wrong place. So we encourage people to report this to Lime. So if you have the, the Lime app, if you're a user or if you're not a Lime user, you can still download the app. You can report it via the app, go into the help section and you can report it there. That's perhaps the easiest way to do it. If you come across a bike because you open the app, you scan the QR code, it automatically knows your location and that gets sent off to Lime. Um, otherwise, you can report it to Lyme using the email address support at li.me um, and they should respond to that. Um, Hounslow Highways are getting contacted a lot uh, directly or via Fix My Street um, and they are starting to take um, a stronger approach on this. Um, so uh, the... the um, SLA, so the surface level agreement um, from Lyme is that for bikes that are obstructing, um, you know, parked in, in a way that is obstructing people, then they need to remove those uh, within two hours. And for bikes that are not obstructing, they need to remove them within 12 hours. Um, I think Hounslow Highways have started using a one hour approach with Lyme. Um, from, from what we've seen, so they've started contacting Lyme, said this bike is obstructing the, the, the carriageway or the pathway. Um, we want to know that you've removed it within an hour or we will come and remove it uh, and take it away from you. Uh, so we're hoping that that will yield some results. And I think Guy will, will just add to that. Unfortunately, having done that yesterday, they've stopped doing it today. So, um, so uh, yeah, absolutely. They've said to, that, that they've written to me also to Tony Lukey saying this is not a Hounslow problem. So I will be dealing with Hounslow Highways in the morning. Sorry? Sorry, I will, uh, you can't hear me. It's usually me that can't hear anybody. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, uh, Hounslow Highways said yesterday. Um, I, put a, I put in a report yesterday and, and I got a very good response which said, um, if you don't, dear Lyme, if you don't move it within an hour, we'll move it for you, basically. Um, they've, I, th I think that was a bit much actually, and they've um, reneged on that today and we need to work out what the right answer is. Because um, today they've sent to me, also to Tony Lukey who reported one today, they said, not a Hounslow problem, which it clearly is. I think there's a bit, I need to get to the bottom of that because there is, they do provide contradictory information sometimes. So if you report something on Fix My Street, then it, it will change it to not 
not the council's responsibility. That means they've passed the request on to Lyme, but it doesn't mean they're not passing on that request to Lyme. Let, should, should we, rather than back and forth, should we get perhaps an answer to that and, and publish that? I think, I think we need to get absolutely clear what they are going to do and what they're not going to do. And that's a conversation that probably... Uh, yeah, so we're, we're having those... Uh, Catherine and I should yeah. have. Yeah, we're having those conversations. So, I, I think there may have been, yeah, so it was a big thing. I mean, the, what's stated in the, the, the MOU, so the memor Memorandum of Understanding between the Council and Lyme, is the two-hour response time and then the 12-hour response time, depending on whether or not it's causing an obstruction. Um, so we need to get more, more clarity on what's going on there. Um, I think... I'll probably pause and, and take any questions. Thanks, Catherine. Um, and just to note that we did ask Lyme to be here tonight. They said they were unable to because of a major event. Um, but uh, just if you put your hands down for questions, put your hand down, Mel. If, put your hand up if you'd like to see Lyme at the next area forum or one after. Great, so now, hands up for questions. Let's see, um, who hasn't spoken? Andy Ward hasn't spoken yet. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your explanation. In fact, you've answered many of my questions, but I thought I'd go across my questions again. One of my questions is the service level agreement from Lyme. Obviously, you've agreed to something with Lyme, being the local authority or the local authority have, not necessarily you. So I think it would be really good, as you just mentioned, to get some super clarity on what that is. What should we do as residents? In what order? Because at the moment, there's three options for us. We can contact the app, which is rubbish, to, to, to talk about the problems. We can email them and they don't respond. Or we can go to Fix My Street and that might go somewhere else. So the first question to you is, please can you come back to the group to tell us what is, what is the, the right thing for us to do as, res as residents? Um, my experience um, with, the, with the line bikes is that, you know, that they break and that is the problem. So yes, they're getting hacked, but generally for me in the bay that's been positioned outside my house without any sort of consultation, I believe with my councillors or myself, is that they're broken, the stands break and they don't stand up so they fall in the road or they fall on the pavement. The, 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 they get a puncture, they don't stand up, they fall over. So. They are just everywhere at the moment, not everywhere, that's an overstatement, but they are a lot. Every day I'm picking up a bike, but I'm going to stop picking up the bikes because I understand that they weigh something like 35 kilos and actually that's beyond the manual handling weight for men to pick up. And I've got a, I won't go into my medical conditions, but I've got a prolapse disc and a hernia and I'm not going to pick them up anymore. It's not my responsibility to pick them up. And that, that goes on to... Report. Andy, can I encourage you to focus on the questions, if that's yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So the question is, you know, you know we, please give us clarity on what we should do. Should we pick them up at all? And also, a point is that they absolutely don't respond in three days to all the reports I've given on broken bikes, blocking pavements and roads. Three days bikes have been there. So it's a joke to say they come in an hour or two hours. Uh, so, yeah. I think, you know, it's a bit frustrating. Our street is now looks terrible. We're very lucky to have a great park, great park in front of us and there literally is bikes littered everywhere. I'm pretty disappointed, I have to say. Thanks, Andy. Okay, well, yes, we'll, we'll come back on those things. Uh, Sam Thomas. Thank you. Uh, just a quick one. Can you ask Lyme to carry out their duties on private land as well? Because uh, I live on Dock Road, which is a private road, and it's littered with Lyme bikes, and I have to move them so I can drive up and down. And it's not only there, but when you report it, because it's private land, it's not recorded. So if you could do that on behalf of the private land in the area, that would be appreciated. So just to check, so have you been reporting that to Lyme or to the council? Lyme. And they they won't come and. It's just that it doesn't doesn't get picked up because it's it's okay. like it's on it's private land. It's not registered on their right on their okay, mapping so we'll, system. We'll talk to them yeah, about thank that. you. Yeah. Uh, Julie, just at the back there. Thanks, Amoy. 
Hi, thanks. Um, the thing on line bikes, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm quite lucky. I haven't got one parked outside my, well, I do, but I haven't got the bulb. Is who, does, who thought of designing them and putting them in certain places? Because we, I know of one that is such a dangerous that any driver comes round a bend, they're right on, on top of the, the bikes if they're not parked right. And if I was a, one of those line bike ones, I wouldn't want to park in a space and then have a 20 minute walk home because that's what you use them for, to ride home. You're not gonna, so you will dump them down. Also, where I am, we have a pathway where it's used for bikes as well. They don't have lights on them at night. So people, they're dangerous for elderly and other people walking down a road on a pathway where they're just laid. But I th I'd love to know who designed them and decided where they were going to go, because there's been no consultation whatsoever anywhere. Uh, yeah, so as I explained, the consultation is happening now. So please do write into um, traffic at hounslow.gov.uk um, and we'll take those, those points on board. There's a hand at the very, very, very back. I can't quite see he's turning his head, their heads. So, yeah, yeah. I can't see. Yeah. Um, I live on the same road as Andy, and um, I'd like to know who I need to write to to actually get the line by Bay on Leetwood Road taken away. The first thing is it's not being used for the purposes. It's being used by children who are hacking them. It's also starting to become increasingly antisocial, and St Paul's Park is a really divine park. The line bikes are being left everywhere. That means that smaller children who are on their scooters, who are on their own private bikes, are basically struggling to get round it. And also, it's supposed to be a cycle route through it, isn't it? Uh, St. Paul's Road, once you turn off and come down St. Paul's Lane. I got, I'm not going to tell you the language that I got when I challenged one of the children the other day on it, but I've spoken to the police about it. And it's like a clicking velodrome. So what it means is, is that kids before school... You can I just, sorry, can I see where there is a lot to get through and there's obviously a That's lot of fine. people who want to come in. Just, to just I, focus, if we can, and sorry, this, I will come back to you. Yeah. Is this is for everyone who's going to speak. Can we just keep it as succinct as possible to a so question? Who do I, who do I need possible. to write to then in that case? If this is a trial, how can I get rid of it in Lakewood Road when it's in front of the kids all the time to be abused? So, so to make any comments or feedback, it's the, the email address is traffic at hounslow.gov.uk. Down at the front here, we've got Mel. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've got two questions and they will be quick, but before I do that through you, can I just welcome back Councillor Dunn into our midst and hope you'll be up and running again as soon as possible. Yes, uh, you can. Thank you, Mel. What are your questions? My two questions are this. First of all, who designed the boxes or bays that these line bikes go in? Because a number of them are, are uh, placed in areas where there is uh, inadequate lighting. And secondly, because these bays are being uh, uh, inadequately lit, when, they're le when the bikes are left outside of the boxes, uh, they're left in dangerous places so that people like myself um, can go apex over base over them because you just cannot see them in the in the dark. Thanks for the brevity, Catherine. Okay, thanks. I mean, obviously, I'm not going to give the names of individual officers, but um, yes, we'll take that on board. We've, I'm going to take um, sort of questions in pairs now because we're really running out of time. So can I just take your question and I'll take your question? And then I'll let Catherine respond to both of them, because there's a, um, there's a slight overlap in some of the questions. Go ahead. Hi, yes, I'd like to clarify the whole situation. Lime is a company that are in business to earn money. We have used public money, our money, to provide bays to park the problem that they brought to this borough. You have taken away our parking spaces and given them to them for what's, your, what's your question, sir? My question is, I believe that you have misused public funds. I've made a Section 1 complaint, and I've told my local council of this. I also spoke to the National what's Audit your Office question? today. What's your question? My question is, do you believe that you have properly uh, not misinterpreted and used public money to support a private company? Thank you for your question. And down at the front here, they want to address both, the, both those questions together. Just to hit this gentleman here. Thank you, 
Chair, uh, Dominic West, formerly of Zion Ward until the Boundary Commission took, her, took us away. Two, two quick points. Um, one is about uh, the Council's contract. I understand that when boroughs signed up with Lyme, we were told that uh, under the age of 18, you were, you were not eligible to hire a bike. Although some boroughs have now found out that it's actually 16 in the small print. Do we know what Hounslow's contract actually says? And given that a number of uh, people riding these bikes are school kids, and tonight I saw school kids steal bikes at Isleworth Station and on South Street, and I've seen bikes dumped all the way down London Road around Bush Corner. Um, it, is, it is worrying that, ha that Lyon won't fix the problem until September, so I, I put it to you that we face a summer of discontent. Catherine. Okay, so on the, the money, so, so Lyme will be, Lyme are paying the council uh, for, for the use of bays, for the rollout of the, the bikes and, and an annual fee, um, as would any other uh, um, operator that, that decided to enter it. We don't have a contract, there are no contracts with, with Lyme, there is a memorandum of understanding, um, so we cannot influence, Lyme, you know, Lyme has its own contract with its customers and that's, that doesn't vary between borough. Um, my understanding is that you do have to be 18 to use it, but given what you've just told me, I'll look into that further. Okay, I'm just going to take two more questions at the back. Um, later on, there's going to, be, um, going to be some breakout groups. One of them is going to be around Lime Bikes. So we've dedicated quite a bit of time to this already. We'll take two more questions, but if you have a question, that can be brought up in the breakout session. So let's hear both of those two questions together. Okay, thank you. Um, I was going to raise the question that's already been mentioned about positioning of some of the uh, bays because one or two are quite dangerous. But on Monday, I became a casualty of a line bike accident. No rider involved. I came home, found it laying across between my car and my front garden gate. Um, my car small, has a slight amount of damage, but my leg has even more damage because I tried to pick the thing up and it fell backwards onto me and I wasn't really in a fit position. I didn't anticipate quite how heavy it was. I then spent two hours trying to report this. It's impossible unless I sign up to an app, give them my bank details and all my personal details. Can I draw you to a question, please? Yeah. Why is there no means to easily report these bikes? Lime don't get back to you. There's no way you can do it by email. The addresses never get responded to. You don't know if you've received it. Thank you. And who is liable? for the accidents. We'll respond to that. Can we take that second question and then we'll let Councillor Dunn respond and then any others we picked up in the breakout group? Was there a second question in that? Is there another? Right at the back, I saw a couple of hands. Yep, there it is. With all these problems with the bikes, and there is absolutely no doubt, they're dumped everywhere. Driving down from Northfield Station this evening, I passed at least nine. I know that's not in your borough, but that's just the way Lyme work. Given all these problems with it, why don't you scrap the scheme straight away? Okay. Councillor Dunn. Right, so if I take that last one first, well, so we've, we've committed to a trial. We could end it early, uh, but... But, yeah, so we've committed to a trial um, with, through this um, memorandum of understanding. Um, we, we could end that early, but that wouldn't obviously give us a full picture. You know, it's only been going a few weeks. Things have already improved. We expect them to improve more. If they don't, we can review. But what I will say is there is nothing to stop Lyme operating in the borough. We cannot stop them doing that. So we can either have a scheme with bays uh, where we can have some degree of control and we can look to, to, to strengthen that around, um, uh, around um, enforcement and so on, or we have Lyme operating as they please with no mandatory bays and bikes left wherever people want to. Thank you very much. So any further questions on Correct. Lyme bikes will be, will be picked up. Um, in, in the breakout group. Don't worry, we're going to move on now. Um, we're going to hear from Thomas and Cairo going to talk about uh, noise disturbance. Go, great to have you with us, guys. Thanks for coming down. Um, 
Good evening. So we're from the Neighbourhood Enforcement Team. Um, we are a seven day a week service. We have four teams that cover different portions of the borough. We're roughly split, split about five or six wards between each team covering north, east, south and west. Um, we re react to complaints from members of the public and we also do proactive case work across a wide remit of issues. We also conduct daily patrols of council housing estates up until 11 p.m. seven days a week. And we also offer a responsive noise team service on Fridays and Saturdays from 10 p.m. until 2 a.m. responding to noise complaints uh, throughout the whole borough. Um, in terms of noise nuisance, we deal with uh, a wide variety of issues from licensed premises to residential premises, uh, construction work outside of permitted hours, um, both residential and um, large scale building sites. We also deal with other statutory nuisances such as light, odour, dust, bonfires, fireworks as well, um, both domestic and commercial. We also deal with uh, fly tipping and waste issues on private land. Commercial waste is an issue that we also deal with in and around the high streets and the large built up commercial areas. Um, abandoned vehicles is another one of our core functions that we deal with throughout the borough. Um, as previously said, antisocial behaviour patrols across the Hounslow Council housing estates and um, also occasionally in parks when they're needed as well. Um, we also work closely with our colleagues in licensing and licensing enforcement, consulting with them on applications for new premises and variation to premises licenses, um, large scale events we also have input in as well. Um, uh, another core function for our team is dealing with unauthorised um, traveller encampments on council land, um, which is, uh, can be quite a difficult issue to deal with at times. Uh, we also have officers within our team that respond to complaints about uh, Mognan sewage treatment works as well, and weekly inspections are done there. Um, there's a, a, another, a few other issues as well that are a bit more niche and a bit more along the lines of environmental health work, which uh, a few of our officers are um, equipped to deal with. Um, so we work with uh, a range of internal and external partners, such as licensing, trading standards, housing enforcement, uh, waste and recycling, community safety, and our CCTV team. Uh, we also try to work as closely as possible with the council funded police team and with the safer neighborhood teams as well. Um, and also working in conjunction when possible with agencies such as Hounslow Highways, uh, Lambton 360 and the like. Um, the easiest method of contact for us is the online e-form service on the council's website where you can report any number of issues to us and that will generate the appropriate report on our system and, and then that will go to a designated officer to deal with the query. Um, we also offer Hounslow Council tenants a answer phone service for them to call up which we've operated for a number of years where they can report any antisocial behaviour or any other such issues. Um, we also have a generic email address for the team as well, which is uh, pollution at hounslow.gov.uk. Um, and a, a quick search on the council website for neighbourhood enforcement will bring up our full details as well, if it's needed. Um, and, and yeah, that's just a, a kind of a brief overview Brilliant. Uh, Thank you. That's, that's really, really great, Thomas. Um, so you, you cover a, a lot of stuff. Um, do we have any, any questions on... Yeah, straight away. First hand up. This lady here. Can you wait for the microphone, please? Thank you. Two questions. How many hundreds of staff have you got to deal with all that is one of them. And also, um, you just mentioned it's easy to find your form on the website. It isn't. If you go to the Your Neighbourhood bit, um, or it actually comes under rubbish, you have to go first to the page where it tells you to report to Hounslow Highways for rubbish in the streets. 
if you scroll down right to the bottom, you find your form. Can we focus on the question, Well, please? my question is, it's, it's not easy to find it. It should be separate that's and not a, listed That's not a question, on... that's a statement. <laughs> All right, then I'll turn it round. Why don't you arrange, please, to have it put separately on that report it page to make it easier for people to find? Uh, we'll certainly take that into consideration and that, and that will be looked at, but personally, when I'm needing to send links to the reporting service to members of the public, if I'm sending it via email, I will just, uh, a quick, simple Google search of Hounslow Council report fly tipping or report noise nuisance will take you to the appropriate web page, but I'll, I'll take your comments on board and that's something that we'll look at. Other than that, the email address that I said, pollution at hounslow.gov.uk, is, is monitored constantly. And as long as contact details and a, a coherent message are left on there with what the issue is that you're reporting, it will be dealt with uh, uh, appropriately. Um, and as, as for numbers, we've been lucky enough that we've actually just managed to recruit uh, a few more staff, so we're, we're quite fully staffed at the minute. We've got four team leaders, four supervisor level officers, um, one of them being myself, and then we've got about uh, 18 enforcement officers, I believe, at the minute, split across the four teams, so. Thank you very much. Before we come to some questions over here, Councillor Sharma wants to come in. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've just actually done a Google search myself whilst you were talking, and it came up straight away, typing in Hounslow enforcement and took it. Great. I Thank just did the report that's true. section on the, on so the borough's website. It's the lady here in the black top, Amoy, if you could. Oh, hello. Hello. Um, I'd like to know, who is the um, health neighbourhood to watch for Sydney Gardens? We, to my knowledge, I don't believe we have dedicated officers for that particular area. Um, but the, as, as I said, the, the answer phone service that is given out to residents is monitored throughout the shift. So any reports of antisocial behaviour or any issues we, a lot of what we do for, for estate-based issues do rely on reports from either members of the public, the residents, and reports from housing officers as well. So if a report does go into a housing officer, they will send us a referral to conduct patrols, and then that goes up for the entire team. So when the team covering that area isn't on shift, the other teams will pick up those patrols and then that's obviously fed back to housing to let them know that, that patrols are being done. Um, but, but it's just a case of getting in contact and, and we'll always respond to, to, to complaints. So right now we haven't got a neighbourhood watch, no? Neighbourhood office? We office will. Somewhere. I don't believe there's currently an active referral for that area, but obviously if there's an issue, if you'd like to have a chat with us once we pop out here, we can certainly yes. see what we can do for you. Okay, because you do have a car parked out every single day in Sydney Gardens, and I believe I spoke to your colleague about that last week. You're sitting outside our roads every single day, not getting out of your car. And I pulled this gentleman up the other day and he had another guy with him and I had a long conversation with them. Thank you. So, so if there's they're a, coming to Sydney Gardens... A, I think if you can work. take that up afterwards as okay. delve into more personal issues. Also, you one can, more thing. We're just going to let people who haven't spoken okay. all get a question. So there's the gentleman behind. Is it on the wall? We'll come back if you can. Thank you. Just hold on, hold on one second. So there's a gentleman behind. We'll, we'll come back to you if there's time. I just want to make sure everyone who hasn't spoken has a chance. We're trying, to, we're trying to keep it as brief as possible so everyone gets a chance to speak. Go ahead, sir. Uh, I'd just like to know, I've had to deal with um, antisocial behaviour for a few years from my noisy neighbours. Um, I've even come to the point, I spoke to them on a number of occasions, but nothing ever happened. So I actually contacted the council, um, heard nothing else. And to be fair, it's making us miserable, like banging all, the, all hours of the night, you know, my son does shift work. We can't, it's just constant banging. Um, we, we, yeah, overcrowding and we've been there. We spoke to them, but when you speak to them, they all gather around their doorstep and make you feel intimidated. Um, I just want to know what's done because I have reported it and nothing's ever come back to me. 
Okay, so I, I think what we need to work out um, where you live and we need to um, speak to individual councillors to take up individual casework. Um, but Thomas Gere, if you want to just give a, a brief answer on that general subject. Yeah, I mean, if, if you want to have a chat with us afterwards, we'd be more than happy to take your details and look into to what obviously the action has, has or hasn't been taken. But just as a general point, the, the general process for, for noise complaints would be um, either a report into us or an online form. Log, sheet, log sheets will be sent out and asked to be returned to give us an idea of, of how and when to tailor any monitoring visits. Um, depending on what the noise is, depends on whether we can actually deal with it. Ordinary domestic noise such as footfall, banging of doors and cupboards, shouting, talking, that sort of thing is not something that we can enforce. Yeah, we but have when you've got to put up with, with it all night long for years, it, swearing uh, in the garden, I, I can't have my grandkids around the garden sometimes because there's too much swearing going I, on. I appreciate that, but, but the, legally, we have, legally we have no powers to deal with that sort of thing. So there, who there's, does then? Well, you could take your own independent legal action that, that would be the only sort of recourse for that, but legally we have no powers to deal with that. Well, that what about if the place is overcrowded? That would be a housing enforcement issue. And but again, we, we, I've, I've reported that as well and nothing happens. Well, I can't comment so, on your so particular case. So I've just got to be so. in. Okay. We, we're, we, we're happy to speak to you afterwards yeah. and take details and pass Either it on. Either speak, speak to Tom or Cairo or come and speak to one of the councillors afterwards and we'll, we'll take that up. Um, any more questions? Yes, sir. Can we we'll just wait for the microphone? Yeah, um, Paul, Paul Berry, uh, Sion and uh, Brentford Lockwood. Can you please um, ask the uh, managers who, who deal with the crews who do the recycling collections, in particular the, the, the multi-recycling on estates, because sometimes they don't put the, the uh, individual containers back in the right place where, where it's labelled, and it's really annoying, and I've actually felt I need to move the bins back into the appropriate places myself. Unfortunately, waste and recycling is not something that we deal with well, directly, so I'm, I'm happy to, to grab some details off you and we can pass that on to our colleagues. And, and uh, luckily we do have the lead member responsible, Councillor Lambert. So if you speak to Councillor Lambert at the end of the meeting, he will definitely be able to help you. And yes, the lady just in the centre there, the white T-shirt. Hi, uh, yes. Um, Obviously, you have a huge remit, um, but do you cover um, um, car emissions where there is um, idling? Unfortunately, no. Um, I, I believe that might be a, a, a criminal offence for which police may be able to give fixed penalty notices for idling vehicles, um, but that, that's not something that we deal with. The, the types of nuisance that we deal with, they have to, they have to be, it has to be a, an individual premises that's causing the issue. So vehicles on the street, even, uh, such as vehicles with loud music as well, is not something that we legally can deal with um, noise on the street. It has to be a premises that's causing the nuisance for us but to the, be able to deal with it. the council puts signs up in the street saying you can be fined. So I don't know how they enforce that. Um, our, our, it's, it's not our team, but it's, okay. it's unfortunately, right. I mean, yeah, we'll have to, yeah. to come back on that one, I'm afraid. Okay, do we have any more questions on this matter? It's a lot to go through. Okay, so now we, thanks so much, guys. Really appreciate that. If you guys want to perhaps hang, hang around for 10 minutes, and actually, actually, if you can hang around for the breakout groups, which are coming up, be fantastic. Um, now we've got, um, yeah, great job. The thriving communities presentation from Michelle, although Michelle seems to have, there she is. Michelle, I asked her to be brief and quick, um, so I'm sure she will. She's done this quite a few times, so take it away. Good evening all. Uh, my name is Michelle Hutchinson. I'm one of the Thriving Communities Grant Managers and so I look after community funding for our residents and community organisations. Uh, we have four pots of funding available for residents and organisations are your neighbourhood grant, which is led by our wonderful councillors. Um, so it's £3,000 per ward or £1,000 per councillor. 
um, projects could provide a lasting community legacy. Our small grants are up to £1,000, and this might be for community events, activities, or new planters. Our revenue grants are our larger pot of funding, and that's for £30,000. Uh, these projects tend to be a longer period and are for constituted groups and voluntary community organisations. And we have our capital grants, which is for um, community buildings, outdoor spaces, projects for gardens um, or refurbishments in our parks and green spaces. So, our Your Neighbourhood grant is, uh, as I said before, it's £3,000 per ward or £1,000 per councillor. And we're looking for priorities around physical improvements to the area, so such as war memorials, uh, historical interest or planters. Something to improve the community infrastructure, so maybe uh, physical resources like uh, tables and chairs for a community space, a defibrillator, um, stuff for youth clubs in the area, activities which involve uh, people in improving their environment. Again, planters, litter picking, lots of groups do that, um, uh, planting events, or community art installations and exhibitions. So something that would bring together the community to do an art project and then to do a community exhibition. Now we're asking our councillors to uh, send in their applications by the 12th of January. You're thinking that's ages away, but it will go really quickly. And we are taking applications on a rolling basis. So if you have an idea, speak to your ward councillor. Our next pot is our small grant. So this is up to £1,000. You don't have to be a constituted group. You could be a group of residents that would like to do something. something uh, we are looking at projects that would improve um, the green and environmental, health and well-being, community engagement and interaction, and projects on our housing estates. We are taking applications on a rolling basis up until March uh, up until the 1st of March 2024. Our revenue pot. So this is slightly different. We tend to have two rounds of funding per year. We had closed one at the end of May this year and we're, you've, we've just given decisions out to our groups that we have funded. So we had 29 applications this round. Our second round will open in September and we will keep our councillors and our groups updated of when that is happening. But for the round that just closed, we will look at the priorities that we were looking for was a greener Hounslow by supporting community food projects and the circular economy, a healthier Hounslow by supporting social connections, by supporting independent living, a thriving Hounslow by supporting our community through employability and skills, a safer Hounslow by keeping young people safe, and a livable Hounslow by building resilience for our Hounslow housing tenants. So as I said, we had 29 applications and we will be doing a big uh, promotion of all the projects that have been funded. Um, so if you do have any ideas or any community groups, please get in contact with us. And our capital programme. So this is a larger pot of funding and it's a two-stage process. So the first stage is an expression of interest. So you might be a resident. You don't have to be a formal group. You could be a resident or a group of residents with an idea or a friends group. You might be thinking, the park's looking a little bit tired. We need new swings. We need uh, a new fence. We need a community garden. You could fill that out. We're not expecting you as a uh, resident or as a community group to necessarily do the work. We would always speak with our teams. Sometimes our teams might manage them, but we would discuss that with you. If it's successful, we would go through the full application. So you either as um, an organization or as a, a group of residents, depending on which way round we're doing it, you'd fill out an application and then we'd assess that as well. So here are some of the things that we have funded in this area. 
So Brentford Voice, you'll see their picture right there. Um, they were awarded just over £23,000 for a capital fund. So that comes from our local neighbourhood sill money. Um, so to do a water, uh, Brentford Waterside Heritage Trail. Uh, the urban, um, the Arban community was funded just over £20,000 from our revenue fund to support family carers. And through our small grant, we supported the Brentford Spoon Project for £1,000 to do um, workshops and exhibitions. So, next steps. If you have an idea, if you have a question about any funding, um, please contact us. You can go on our website to find more information. You can email us or you can phone us. So there's myself, um, Michelle Hutchinson, or my colleague, Kate Wilson. Um, there's two of us in the team. And if you do have any questions, please do let us know. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. How many, how many times have you done that presentation? Many times, many times. Brilliant. Um, I think if you have any questions on that, if you can get in touch directly with Michelle or, or speak, speak to her afterwards. Was it, did, we have a pressing question from Jim Stora. Okay, um, as it's Jim, I'm assuming this is going to benefit everyone else as well. Thanks. Hi, Michelle. Thanks for that. Um, I wondered if you could just say a little bit about the where the money for the Thriving Community Fund comes from, the origin of the money. Yes, not a problem. Um, so our Thriving Communities Fund, it's made out of three pots of money. So the first pot is our community grant, which is mainly for revenue projects such as small grants or our revenue pot. Our, third, our second pot of funding comes from HRA, so that's our housing revenue account. So, right. any, so any projects um, that would benefit our Hounslow tenants, our housing tenants. Um, so if there was something on an estate, um, let's just say like clay ponds, we would be able, that would come out of that funding. And our third pot would be from our local neighborhood seal. So when there's, um, uh, development and infrastructure so the community infrastructure levy that comes from that so that tends to be for our uh, larger capital pots is that like a developer tax yes brilliant okay so in a bit we're going to go into those aforementioned breakout groups but before we do that i just be if there's a question a, a topic a, a subject around antisocial behavior that hasn't been covered if you've got a question around antisocial behavior that hasn't been covered or isn't likely to be covered in the breakout groups um now's your chance okay then i'm going to hand over to lara who's going to explain how we are going to do the next little bit okay hello everyone um so we have done a poll on Facebook. Some of you may have completed that. And on the topic of, topic of antisocial behavior, and five themes came up as of higher interest, and they were fly tipping, community activities for young people, like provision activities, spaces, noise disturbance, both from residential and from businesses, lime bikes, clearly, and on like more proper crime, vandalism, intimidation, and abuse. Those were what came out during the, the Facebook poll, but the, the, the sentiment here in the room might be different today. So I'll ask you, I've just read out the five topics, I'll do it again, fly tipping, community activities, noise disturbance, line bikes, vandalism, intimidation, and abuse, as one. I'll just ask people to sh do a show of hands in what topic they're most interested in going to a breakout group to continue the discussion. So if you can show your interest on the topic of fly tipping, please. Okay, <laughs> um, great. Uh, on community activities, provisions for young people. Okay. Um, okay, and on noise disturbances. Okay. Online bikes. Yay, okay. And on like vandalism, intimidation, abuse. Okay. Um, so 
on, also on that note, so Lime Bike is the one with most interest and also needs to be in here because Catherine will be leading that discussion. Uh, so we'll, we'll, that group will mainly stay here. Others of us, and you can see, taking into account what the venue is like, we don't have actual rooms for us to go in and have the discussion. So we're just going to have to spread ourselves around the room to have that discussion. Um, so I am going to ask Marina, we'll take the community activities provision discussion to that little table here on the right outside. So Marina leads the way and people who want to go talk to Marina about that can go outside. And this is not just a, a quest, questions to Marina session, it's an exploration conversation about how we can come up with solutions, provisions for young people in Brentford. On the topic of um, vandalism, intimidation and abuse, that's with Reese. Reese, if you can take the group to the, the corner there. Follow Reese if you're interested in that discussion. Yeah. <laughs> and on the topic of fly tipping, there was only one person. How, how interested are you still on that topic? You're interested in, okay, okay. So Guy and I can, can go, uh, so Guy and I can go into that corner of the room over there, yeah? And on noise disturbance, uh, Dan, maybe you can take people outside? Outside. Yeah? I think so, right? So follow the relevant counselor, we'll have, Tell him how long the you have the conversation for 20 minutes. And then you have to come back here because we're going to report back on what has been said. So lots of conversations going on. Thank you for coming back to your seats. We're now moving on to agenda item seven, which is the open forum. This is an opportunity for members of the public to address the meeting on general issues relating to the agenda and other issues not on the agenda. Please note, individual cases cannot be discussed. Do we have any open forum questions? Uh, Pirin at the back, can we get a mic to Pirin? I oh, see all the community development officers just, they went for the, went for the, went for the buffet. Here we go. Uh, thank you, councillors. Um, this is a sort of multifaceted question, actually. So there's several parts to it. So I'm sorry if I go on a little bit. I'll try to keep it as succinct as possible. Um, but it's basically about a live issue of Waterman's Park and the proposed marina that's going on there. And so for some years, there has been concern of the financial state of the Moffat companies. Uh, and I want to ask if the marina at Brentford would share some of the same difficulties that are being experienced by other moorings run by the Moffat companies. For example, Chelsea Yacht and, uh, Yacht and Boat Harbour is particularly troubled at present with several unprovoked evictions, various legal actions, and they're not good landlords. So why has the council made a deal with this firm particularly? That's one question. And then to carry on, if I may, I'm aware that the council and the PLA have various deadlines at the Waterman Park development um, have, been, have come and gone. There have been extensions and the current MMO license for construction has been extended to complete the works by the 29th of September this year. Um, to, my, to my mind, there should be a penalty for non-delivery of this this time and maybe this should include the loss of right of the second phase of the development. Uh, would, would you, councillors, be prepared to do this? And what this would do is um, uh, encourage a possible alternative community there, which I could help uh, to build a different future for the upper sections of the moorings, uh, which would be cooperatively run, possibly a heritage harbour, harbour that's managed for the benefit of local people, the existing boats on the river, and help incorporate the boat dwelling community, which has been much overlooked and undervalued by the council. And so we need your support in this. Thank you. Thank you for a, a very simple question with uh, not <laughs> many many thoughts. Sorry about that. No, the, you raised you raise some really key issues. There have been some delays and um, uh, particularly with the, it's a bit of a complex relationship with the PLA, with the council and with the developer. If it's all right, if, if, we, if I can follow up with you afterwards, um, and uh, I, think, uh, I, I think you've been aware of the conversation with Mike Sudler around corporate property uh, and, and where that's all gone. 
Um, but I will take, I'll, if you give me a copy of, of, of what you've raised, I'll take all of them and make sure you, you get an answer to them. Is that right? Thank you. Thanks, Pirin. Yes, over here, please. Hi, this is just a very uh, quick one to say um, there desperately needs to be a carer's centre in Hounslow somewhere. And the, the vast majority of people I've asked all, all agree. Councillor Sharma, do you want to come in on that? Um, yeah, thank, um, thank you for that question. Um, some of you might not realise um, or, or know, my background is in health and social care. Um, previously worked for a domiciliary care provider. Um, I, I totally agree with what you're saying about there needs to be more, more um, carer centres. There are some provisions that are out there. Um, we need to communicate that more to our residents. Sorry, can you just wait for the mic? Is that right? Sorry. Hi, I'm talking about where there's one centre in Hounslow somewhere where if anybody finds out they're a carer, they can go there and get information about anything. And there's, there's rooms where they can be sort of, I don't know, where there's things going on. There's information, there's people there all the time because it's, there's no one place in the whole of Hounslow and it's appalling because the, the, all the surrounding areas all had, had carers' centres and they work very well. We are actually rolling out family hubs and children's hubs within the borough. So we are, we're, we're going to be having, well, they're going to be in, in different, they're going to be one in Hounslow Central, there's going to be one, there's one at the moment in Feltham, and there's going to be one in, in the East as well. Cool. Well, um, send, send me an email about it and we'll, we'll see if we can look at the wider question. But um, yeah, any, any other questions? I cannot, yep, go ahead, Margaret. I'm, re I'm asking about what's well, just, just nearly two years since myself and the chemist met with two representations, representatives from the council housing department about the pigeons in Brentford High Street. They had a, a meeting with us. No, don't you that in our so, so can't hear you. What? We can't hear you. Right. What are you doing about the pigeons and doing, putting the spikes up? You know where I'm talking about, from Goddard's right to the end of uh, your block that you own, own, own. Two years you've been written to, you've had pictures sent to you showing you the mass of pigeons, and you still... If you, when you, if you hold the microphone just to your mouth. You still haven't done anything about it. The only thing that has been done is the sweet, the woman or the man that sweeps the street cleans that part outside the chemist. Now, I have approached all the shops along there and asked them not to feed the pigeons. And they've told me they can do what they want. Over to you. And so this is the pigeons on Brentford High Street? Yes, on the council block, between the next to Goddard's, right down to Greg's. Thank you. Did we get a response on this, Bill? Uh, yeah, we've, we've had a response from Sabeel Khan. Who's, um, from who? Sabeel Khan. I can give you his details. I've got your email address, so I can I can't you like respond to that. Or are you happy to respond? Yeah. Or Councillor Dunn, who's the Cabinet Member for Environment, will respond. So, so I think you've been in touch with Alistair, um, and he's, he's been, um, basically procuring these pigeon spikes uh, to go up. So they, it is happening. I appreciate it's been a bit slow, yes. but, but that is happening. But the main problem is that someone is feeding the pigeons. Yes, we know who's feeding them. Yeah. And it's just not the shop selling the nuts. There's people off the street come and feed them. Yeah. Yeah, I know. So, but, so we won't have to wait another two years before you put the spikes No, up. we won't have to wait another two years. Can I ask my next question now? You know, just, we're just going to make sure everyone has a question before people have a second question first. But I think there may well be time to come back to you. Any other questions? Someone who hasn't spoken. John Dale. 
Just wait for the microphone if that's all right. Uh, Brentford Dock Gating, it's the same question we ask every single forum, but what's the situation there? So, so the last time, um, I think Councillor Dunn said, you, you were in talking, you were talking to Brentford Dock Limited. Uh, since then, they have started locking the gates and they're taking a vote at the moment on locking them even more. So what, how are those talks going? Councillor Dunn. Thanks. John, yes, so we have, um, there have been talks between the Council and, um, and Brentford Dock Limited. Uh, I think it's fair to say that, that you know, that don't see, we don't see eye to eye. Um, so the Council has proposed a compromise that would involve uh, locking the gates only after dark or at certain times of, uh, of the day, so, you know, in the evening. Um, so that, that, that wasn't accepted. <laughs> Um, but uh, there has been an agreement that the locking of the, the Riverside gates that's gone ahead will be reviewed um, after a six month period. Um, as you said, uh, BDL are now consulting their residents on locking the gates that they've installed at Dock Road and at the footbridge from Brentway. Um, I mean, we'll have to see what happens. My, I think that may well have a different outcome from the previous consultation because locking these gates would cause inconvenience for residents and for their visitors. Uh, so we'll have to wait and see. Um, we'll continue to make the case uh, as council for why we think people should have access to the Riverside. Um, but you have seen those, the legal documents that, uh, that a Brentford Dot resident posted on, on your Facebook group, John. So I think you, you are aware of the council's position there. Okay, any, any other questions? Yes, right here in the front. Thanks. Um, what have been the measured biodiversity benefits of Hounslow Highways not cutting the grass verges for three months when Hounslow Homes cut theirs and Green Space 360 cut theirs and mowed the lawn in the parks? I'm not sure we'll be able to provide the exact data, but Councillor Lambert's best place, I think, to cover that. I mean, as, as you probably know, sorry, as, as you probably know, we had a policy of no mo, no mo may. But yeah, no, it applies everywhere. No, it hasn't. So Hounslow Homes cut all the grass verges and all their land that they're responsible for throughout the whole year the whole of May, June and July, they as did Green Space 360. They didn't cut it all, because I know ones where they didn't. Well, for instance, Isleworth Green, uh, Lampton 360 cut Isleworth Green, um, Hounslow Homes did the section outside the blocks, Percy Road, Percy okay, Gardens. Okay, let's, let's not descend so, so, into so, so, an example. cut what, but you just re re research just the question part of your statement, if you could. Yes, yeah, so the question was, what have been the biodiversity benefits, measurable biodiversity benefits, of a third of the council not cutting the grass verges effectively, because the other parts of the council have. I, I, well, I don't think that I, I don't think they're easily measured um, because they're, they're quite. Um, they they will be better for bees. A lot of people like them. Some people don't. Um, it was an experiment this year. We did it in some places, not in other places. Um, and we'll, we'll try and learn from that with the feedback that we get from people like you. Um, my own view is I like it where, the, the, where partly they've not been mowed. I think we didn't necessarily get the right places. Um, we'll learn from that and do better. A bit like a couple of years ago, we started with wildflowers. Wildflowers were successful. We need more of them, we need different ones, and we'll do more of that. Thank you. Any, <coughs> any other questions? Uh, Jim Storer at the back. I, <coughs> hello, Dan. <coughs> My question is about uh, <coughs> the future of Waterman's Art Centre. I think it would be true to say that very many in the majority in the community have been very patient waiting for some indication of what's planned uh, 
well, for the future of Waterman's as an arts centre and also what's going to happen on the two linked sites and the, which are the existing Waterman's centre and the police building in Half Acre. Um, I mean, I think there was a confidential report went to Cabinet, to the last Cabinet, was it, I think? Can you say when the community will be given a much better idea of what's actually being proposed? Councillor Williams. Thanks, Jim. I think the answer is we'll give everyone in Brentford a better idea when, when we are actually confident that we have set timescales that we are confident will can be delivered against. This application obviously was passed many years ago and we're obviously impatient for it to come forward as well. We really want to see the Waterman site, the police station site redeveloped and, and to have the new arts centre and to have the homes that go with it. Unfortunately, uh, the market is not exactly where it was five years ago when that was passed. You know, there is a lot of delay in the built environment sector at the moment because of things like interest rates, borrowing costs, labour costs, labour shortages. Uh, it is not possible at this stage to be more precise and that's, you know, but we're working on it is the answer and we are trying to find a way to get the scheme moving. And, and you know, that's what we're seeing on other sites in Brentford as well that, aren't, that we aren't directly in control of as well is, is that things are slowing down. Things are not as viable as they were several years ago. It's the nature of the market, it's the nature of, 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 the, of the very bad position uh, the economy is in and the impact that that has on the people who, whose jobs it is, is to, to bring these projects forward. Uh, they have to be viable and we have to get there. So that's, that's, the, that's the situation. Thank, thanks very much, Grace. Uh, I mean, your point, I think <clears throat> we understand the position in the in the market at the moment. I think it's an issue of, about communication though. If, if, if that is the case, if that's the reason why uh, development is going ahead, then wouldn't it be better to let the community know exactly what the state of play is? And that, it may just be to simply say, sorry, we don't know yet because the state of the market, but, uh, um, and also it relates <clears throat> that the, you could, I, I guess, put forward uh, some of the current proposals on the nature of the proposed new Waterman's Art Centre. Uh, will it be as it was originally specified or will it be something somewhat scaled down? It's just a matter of communicating what, what is going on, really. Uh, good, good news or bad news. <laughs> we, we would love to get to a position where we can give you that news one way or another. I think, you know, there are commercially sensitive conversations that are going on. There are other parties involved. There are always, you know, we're in negotiations with people and, and, and businesses. It's not possible to do that in public. It's, it's, and no one, no one does, uh, you know, it's not, it's not a Hounslow thing. It's, you know, that's, that's the nature of how this is done. And I mean, I totally agree that uh, on sites that we don't control, where, where, they, where they know what is going on, they should talk to us and we should know about delays that are coming forward. And uh, ideally, thanks, we thanks, should Bruce. know about them before, before you do. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Um, we're really tight on time. So um, the gentleman right at the back, I don't think I've heard from him all evening. Thank you very much. Um, very parochial to where I live. But could the councillors tell me how much Hounslow Highways have squandered on the eyesores at the end of White Star Road? They have probably made at least 20 visits. I nickname them the Hounslow Bodgers because that's clearly what they are. They turn up, they do a bit, they change their mind, they come back and do something else. They bring another lot of barricades, they waste their time, they so, put a couple sorry, more posts uh, up. Sorry. So the question, the question is, could I be told how much has been spent on that one stupid project? Which project? The bunkers in the middle of White Star Road. Barriers or white style. The, 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 fact, the fact of the matter is, Hounslow Highways have been back there at least 20 times from the inception of the bomb 
bunkers that we had planted there originally. Can I comment on this? So the, I do not know how much money was spent on the barriers. The reason why there was such a delay was because for some reason uh, there was a shortage of those physical planters Therefore, well, there was. We don't want those planters anyway. We okay, but there was a, the, 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 the plan is for the, the the plan is for those planters to be in place to, for it, that for the LTN or the, the traffic restriction to operate, and for a certain period of time, it had to How be the plastic is, one <laughs> with water in it because there was a shortage of the concrete planters. Therefore, yes, there was a delay, and, and Hounslow Highways had to continue they, going back. They've been back loads of times before that. First of all, they they put the bunkers down. Then they came back and put down a platform, a curb. Thank you. In terms, of, in terms of your specific question on what well, the total cost has been. Can I be told how been, much it's cost? You, you can, but we don't have that information right now. If you leave your details, we'll, we'll, we'll look that. into getting that response Thank to you. you. If you. If you don't want to leave your details, you can take one of our, one of our business cards. Thank you. Uh, Richard Eason. Thank you. Following on from Jim's question and Reese's very informative um, answer, um, I deduce from that that the it's confirmation that the housing market is broken and is going to stay broken for the foreseeable future, perhaps um, a generation. In that context, um, our expectations of private development um, meeting the housing needs uh, on the land that it's vacant in Brentford. Um, seems very low. What are the views of the councillors about preparing um, to take that land into public ownership for public housing um, as soon as um, government conditions, i.e. a new uh, Labour government next year, might allow? So if I could, I mean, we, as you know, Richard, we have we have commitment to, to building council housing and, and to purchasing housing for um, f for use uh, as council housing and, and for housing people in, in the private sector, private sector, but at affordable rates. Um, you know, those are our ambitions. Anything that we can take advantage of to to enable that to, to happen uh, sooner or to a greater degree, of course, would be something that we would look at, look upon very favourably. Okay, any other questions before we move on from there? Abigail Hardy over here. Just wait for a mic if you can, Abigail. It's just so people watching online and, and if anyone's using the hearing Hi. loop. Um, I just wanted to mention about the clearing of the weeds on specifically the Zion estate. Mum lives in Beach Avenue. And um, I'm, Field Lane looks really quite good, but the Zion estate looks really shabby. And in the road that my mum lives in, and I'm there twice a day, every day, every day of the year, looks like it's not been done at all and I was just wondering if anyone else had experienced that anywhere else in Brentford that those that are coming along to take the weeds away are not doing a particularly good job or we did have the signs up to say we had to move all of our cars and and, I'm, and we did and I'm presuming that someone went along but because I work full-time I wasn't there to witness it um, and this my is Be mum's pretty Beach, old. Beach Avenue Beach isn't Avenue. it but around the rest of the Zion estate is looking pretty grim and uh, it looks shabby. So I was just wondering if anyone else had had the same experience and if so, or can someone come and recheck Zion Estate and have a look and see how badly it looks at the moment, please? It's the weed clearance. Okay, any other questions? Got another one from, I think, we'll let Margaret come in first, because I, I, I stole her second question from her before, then we'll come to John Doe. Right, um, I'm very, very, very concerned about the closure of the ticket offices, and please don't say it's nothing to do with you. It is, it's to do with all of us. And I'm asking the council, I would ask Brent, uh, Hounslow Council to get on to the powers to be to keep some of our ticket offices open. 
Brentford is very useful. It's open until 10.30 in the morning and we all haven't got apps. We all haven't got the facilities to book online all the time. And you have, I'm asking you all please to email the place and ask for all our ticket offices. Thank you, Margaret. Yeah, I, I, look, but firstly, I completely agree with you. I know there's conversations ongoing. We're not happy with it. Councillor Dunn's probably best place to give a bit more detail on that. Um, yes, so I can confirm that the council is, um, intense to, is preparing a response to the consultation on planned ticket office closures um, and will, of course, be um, raising concerns about the potential effects of those planned closures, particularly on our elderly residents and those who are disabled or digitally excluded. Um, we, we note that you know, the, the claims being made are, oh yes, we're going to close the ticket office, but there'll be other staff available to help people purchase tickets. We're very skeptical about that um, and dubious about the level that it would be provided. So we will be making a response as a council on that. Um, obviously, um, individual councillors, uh, you know, can, can do that as well. And I'd encourage all residents to respond as well. Don't worry, we will. That's very good information. The, yeah, that's the, I think the public response. Um, John Dale, I wonder what you're going to ask this time. Okay, do you want to let someone else hold your camera, John? Amoy, Amoy can I'll, hold I'll it. I'll be okay. Um, no, no, I'm absolutely fine. Yeah. Three months ago, um, a planning application came before the... Uh, planning committee for Manderson House Commerce Road. Uh, as uh, it ended in chaos and a lot, a lot of eyebrows were raised over uh, the way the decisions were reached. Afterwards, the council decided to uh, order an inquiry asking all members of that planning committee how they'd voted and why. Do we know the results of that inquiry yet? And if not, will you keep us informed? Um, we, we, don't have, uh, we, we don't have the results of that, John. Uh, as, as and when we can. This lady here. Yes, could I ask again about car idling and who is enforcing it in the borough? Because we have the signs up in our street. Um, I presume they're put up by the council. Um, but I don't know what happens about enforcing it. So was that about idling? Idling, car idling, yes. yes. So there, is, there are issues around this, and we did sort of launch a campaign um, a couple of years ago um, and with the intention of being able to enforce against it and, and issue um, PCNs. The legal situation apparently isn't as straightforward as we thought it was, and we've been told we, we don't have the powers to do that. Um, I've asked officers to get to the bottom of this, um, uh, but it, it, unfortunately at the moment it looks like a situation where the, the legislation isn't what we thought and, and it may require additional legislation, but I, I think we need to explore every avenue to make sure, you know, to see if the, what we can do. Because it actually says there's a fine of like £60 or something. Yeah, so we were, in, we, were um, we took part in a, some... Um, a trial or something with the, 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 the GLA, with the Great London Assembly on this. Um, that's sort of come to an end and we are looking at what we can do to get back to a position where we can issue fines. Okay, because Richmond Borough have huge signs up, huge metal signs, not like the flimsy ones that we have, so they must be enforcing it. They have huge signs, so they spent money on signage. I need, to, I need to dig around a bit in it, but I, I'm happy to come back. Okay, because it's yeah. a real please, problem please in my street. Please leave your details. Right please leave your details with Councillor Dunn, and she'll be able to give you a more, a more thorough response. Now, right, we're supposed to finish at 9.30, but I think we've got time for one last question from Sam Thomas. Captain Mike's coming behind you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to talk about the Brentford Canal Festival. First of all, I'd like to thank volunteers from our councillors that joined us and other volunteers in the room that helped run such a successful day. Now, we've had two canal festivals now, and they've just grown in momentum. So 
Martin behind me, uh, Simon, myself, um, and other members of Brentford Voice have really pushed and made that a success to ensure its legacy, sustainability. Can I ask the councillors, go back to the council, make sure that it's correctly publicised throughout the year, look for whatever funding you can find for us to put into the Canal Festival and help us to promote and get volunteers involved, not only on the day, but help us set up the event people with specific skills in fundraising, event management, anything like that. Your range of contacts would be really helpful if you could get involved and help Brentford as a community to get the festival up and running next year. Thank you, that's a great question to close on. Um, I think... Okay, we're gonna go for John Dale's question and then we're gonna finish on Sam's question because I don't know what John's gonna do. <laughs> go on, John. Um, uh, I noticed you didn't put out a card for Councillor Balraj Soe. Uh, is is uh, Councillor Soe taking any active uh, involvement in council work these days, or has he just packed it in? So I don't think any of us can answer for uh, Councillor Sarai. I do think it's a shame that he's not here this evening to answer your question himself. Um, th there isn't much more I can say. I mean, we do. We have expectations of our councillors that involve an appropriate level of attendance, casework, public engagement. If we think individuals aren't pulling their weight, uh, they will be reminded of this and action taken if necessary. Um, yeah, that's where we are. Um, so, thanks for that, Councillor Dunn. Uh, yeah, <coughs> Sam, the, the, Brentford, the Brentford Canal Festival was fantastic. It uh, continues to have my full-throated support and happy to explore how I can uh, f facilitate that beyond and within, within wider contacts. And I'm sure I speak for all the other councillors here. Uh, yeah, it's nodding. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, it's, a, yeah, it's a fantastic event. Um, so they've got feedback forms uh, on your under your chairs, you should have got when you, come, when you came in, please fill them in. Um, it's really important, it helps us understand uh, what we're doing, what we can do better, who's coming, uh, and that does influence further things. Just a few more things on the agenda. Um, we've got the minutes of the IBAF meeting held on the 27th of April 2023. Obviously, that, this is now the Sign and Brentford Area Forum. That was the previous forum of Isleworth um, and Brentford. Um, so, Hounslow South, Isleworth and Austin in Spring Grove Area Forum, Hasai uh, uh, They uh, they were presented the minutes and the members who had been present on the 27th of April noted them. So, it's now down to Brentford and Sion Area Forum members who were at the last meeting of IBAF, which I believe is all of us. Um, we now have the opportunity to confirm those minutes. Everyone happy with the minutes? Brilliant. Urgent business. Any other business? Councillor Williams. It's not urgent business, but I'd just like to say, do fill out the feedback form. I'd like, I want to congratulate Dan. You know, we, we are a listening council, and I know everyone thinks that we're not, but we are, and we're here. And Dan tried something different tonight with this, with this, with this setup. Uh, the polls online were great. We, we asked people in Brentford what they wanted to talk about. We designed an agenda around that. We did breakout sessions. It's a new format. Um, let us know if you think it worked. We know, we, I'm sure Dan wa wants to perfect this uh, forum so it can be as useful as it can be. And, you know, it is a two-way conversation. Um, and I hope you all enjoyed it. And I just want to thank Dan for trying something different. Very kind, thank you. Oh. Um, so the date of the next scheduled meeting is the 2nd of October 2023. Two things I want to say today. Um, one is congratulations to uh, St Paul's Rec and to the Waterman's uh, Park, who have both won green flags in the last couple of days for the first time ever. So, uh, 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 and the credit for that goes to the, to, mainly to the people who run the Friends 
and uh, so some of them some of them are here to, tonight the uh, St Paul's mob the uh, the Waterman's Park mob are not um, the other thing is uh, it's something else that I've been running or not running but trying to run via the uh, at, at the uh, area forum which is to try and get a more engagement and um, excitement in our local library. Um, so I've, I've, I've been trying to get people to come and become, to think about how we would get the set of, of friends going. Um, I only got two people, well I've got three, three or four people who, who um, volunteers, but only a couple of them did I meet. Um, I, I, I think there's stuff to be done. I've also met somebody who wants to do something about the garden. Um, and I think there's plenty to do in the, in the, in the library, um, which, might, which might be controversial, but I think I'd love to have the library a much more exciting place than it has been recently. So if people, people are willing to take part in that, I know Margaret, was, uh, Margaret talked to me some time ago with, 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 with her posse of friends. Um, and, and, and I'm trying to move forward with something on the library. Do yeah, okay. Well, so, 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 if you want to involve, get involved. Yeah. Thank you, Guy. So the meeting's yeah. due to finish at 9.30. The councillors will be around if you want to follow up on anything that's come up in the meeting. So thank you all for coming. And a reminder that the next scheduled meeting is on the 2nd of October, 2023. And huge thanks to all the officers who helped put this on from Community Development and Brentford Free Church for being, as always, fantastic hosts. Thanks again.